I want to start um, by saying that uh, the presentation I'm going to give isn't about numbers. Um, there are plenty of uh, articles that have come out in the, in the media over the past couple of years about how, uh, how much the Asian market has grown, how quickly it's growing. Uh, just uh, two days ago, I think there was something in the Financial Times saying that the Asian market, um, or sorry, emerging markets for specialty coffee, or coffee in general, grew by 10% in 2012, which is one of the uh, largest rates of growth uh, in history of coffee. Um, and Russia and China were listed as two of the sort of uh, driving forces behind this growth. So there's just a lot of data out there. You know, it's pretty interesting, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. I, I want to focus more on sort of the nuances of the Asian market. I want to start by just telling a, a personal story from my childhood. Um, bear with me, it's, it, uh, it actually is kind of funny at the end. But um, when I was a small boy growing up in suburban Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I'm from, uh, there are two things I remember that were always in the kitchen cupboard. One was a short, uh, clear jar of Sanka instant decaf, and the, uh, right next to that was a taller, opaque jar of Carnation non-dairy instant creamer. And um, after my mom had immigrated to the U.S. in the 1960s, she somehow developed a taste uh, for coffee and obviously didn't need the caffeine since she was drinking Sanka. Um, she got that from tea, but uh, she really liked coffee, and for a long time, that's what she drank. If we fast forward to the early 2000s, uh, when I started working for Altera Coffee Roasters, I often would give my free uh, weekly take-home pound to my parents for them to try. And one day I asked my mom what she had thought about a coffee I had given her recently. And she said, and I'm not kidding, well, the, the Colombian was okay, but it, it's not as good as the Ethiopia Harar horse. And I was like, wow, so you're actually paying attention to what I'm giving you. Uh, well, you know, for the next nine or 10 years, nothing was as good as the Harar horse, nothing. I tried micro lots from Central America, I tried Kenya's, I tried everything. Um, even other natural process grade for Harars, thinking, well, you know, that's her, that's her thing. She likes a Harar. No, it wasn't as good as the horse. It actually got so bad that she later stopped drinking specialty because she was just frustrated. She couldn't find anything that to her was as delicious and sweet and fruity as the Harar horse. Uh, up until last year, um, I gave her a small bag of a grade four natural processed Harar that had been sourced and roasted by Orser Coffee in Taichung, Taiwan. Orser is owned by Zhou Xu. Uh, some of you know him. He is a member of the International Relations Council. And uh, she took a sip, and I was watching her, thinking, oh, you know, she's not going to like this either. And she goes, hmm, this is as good as the horse. Um, and I was like, yes, finally. Uh, of course, you know, that coffee's in Taiwan. I'm here. Uh, kind of a problem. But anyway, I, I tell this story because it's indicative of two things. One is a growing appreciation of specialty coffee among Asians and people of Asian descent. And also, this is indicative of the rapidly evolving market for specialty coffee, particularly at the retail level. We've all known for years about the proclivity of the Japanese for high quality coffee. That's not anything new, but eight to 10 years ago, who would have expected or dreamt that the South Korean coffee market would, um, would boom the way it has? In 1999, uh, Starbucks entered uh, mainland China with a couple stores, one of which was infamously located inside the Forbidden City. They got a lot of flack for that. And in 2011, Starbucks announced that by the year 2015, they were going to have 1,500 stores across China, making China the second largest market for them at the retail level after the US. Uh, they also announced plans to enter into a joint venture with government officials to invest in a uh, farm, um, in a plantation in southern China, in the province of Yunnan, uh, that would also uh, include a producer support center as well as processing facilities. Um, also, specialty coffee is making uh, some inroads in Southeast Asia in the metropolises of Bangkok, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Singapore, Jakarta. Uh, let's not forget what, um, what's going on in India as well, but I'll let uh, Sunalini Menon tell you about that herself because I know nothing about India. Um, you may be wondering why this is all happening so fast. Um, it's pretty easy, it just comes down to one word, money. Um, as the economies in Asia continue to boom, uh, the level of uh, personal income is, is higher than it was before, and this leads to increased consumer spending. 
Uh, what's interesting is that specialty coffee is perceived by many in Asia, particularly uh, younger people in, in urban centers, as being hip and trendy and Western. Um, and as more people enter the middle class in places like China, uh, this market will just continue to grow. And it's not necessarily because people actually like the taste of coffee, but because it connotes wealth and status. Um, there's an interesting kind of phenomenon that happened in South Korea. In 2007, there was a, a very popular TV drama called The First Shop of Coffee Prince. And it was an instant hit. Um, two years later, it was followed by another TV drama called Coffee House. And both of these series have actually been credited for helping to fuel the frenetic growth of the South Korean cafe scene. And for those of you who have been to Seoul or other cities in South Korea, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's crazy uh, how many cafes you see on the street. Um, just last November, I was there for the uh, annual Seoul Cafe show. And one of uh, my customers was telling me that up until recently, you never really saw people walking down the street with a cup of coffee in hand. But um, now you're, uh, they were starting to see it, and it, he attributed it to a very popular American TV show that had been uh, broadcast in South Korea called Sex in the City. <laughs> and in Sex in the City, uh, the character played by Sarah Jessica Parker is often seen walking down the streets of New York with a cup of coffee in hand. And people in South Korea, men as well as women, thought this was cool and hip, and so they started doing it themselves. Um, so you, you kind of get an idea of how quickly things catch on in, in Asia, you know, especially with um, social media and internet. Uh, trends develop really quickly and they just take off and sometimes just kind of like left there standing, you know, wondering how did this just, this just happen? Um, but it does and, and that's, that's how Asian consumers tend to operate. I don't want to give you the impression that commercial grade coffee doesn't exist in Asia. It certainly does. It's still um, a large part of the market. Uh, Nescafe in particular is quite uh, prevalent. Uh, in China, you can buy Nescafe in little packets with powdered milk and sugar that are already mixed in. You just dump into a cup and add water. Um, that's, you know, for a lot of people, that's coffee. Um, but for many young consumers, um, we don't necessarily need to, quote unquote, convert them from commercial grade uh, to specialty. If we think of them as kind of like a blank canvas, and we in this room are the artists, you know, we don't, we don't need to use the Crayola, Crayola watercolors. We can jump right to the oil-based paints because they don't know any better. Um, we don't need to kind of coddle them and bring them up. You know, they're ready for, for the real stuff. It's also interesting to note that many Asian coffee drinkers don't really know where coffee comes from. Uh, you know, if they do, they may think, oh, it comes from Brazil or Colombia. But, um, you know, I think that gives a lot of origins the opportunity to brand themselves as specialty origins, particularly countries like El Salvador and Honduras, um, countries that don't really sort of figure into people's uh, knowledge of the world. Um, but yet, here's a micro lot from this country that's outstanding, and oh, Honduran coffee must be, must be amazing, or Salvadoran coffee must be amazing. Uh, which isn't to say there aren't amazing coffees from Colombia and Brazil, of course. But um, for, the, for the countries that aren't as well known um, in the Asian coffee market, I think it's, you know, again, a blank canvas. Finally, there are just a lot of people in Asia, millions and billions of them. And if you think uh, that this market is just now really picking up, who knows where it's going to go? Uh, you know, really, I think uh, the possibilities are almost limitless. I can see some of you, at least in the audience, or I can imagine that um, some of you have dollar signs in your heads, or reais, colones, pesos, quetzales, or whatever. Um, but if you think that doing business in Asia is going to be easy, um, think again. It's definitely not true. It's, it's far from the reality. Uh, Asia is a very diverse place, obviously. Each country has its own culture, history, uh, characteristics, and even peculiarities. And a one-size-fits-all approach just isn't really going to work, even though there are a lot of common threads that bind Asian countries together. Also, coffee consumption has evolved differently in each country, and uh, therefore, uh, retailers have had to adapt to local tastes and um, particularly companies coming from overseas, like Starbucks, have had to um, navigate not only the language barrier um, and unique business environment, but really figure out what customers and um, or consumers really want and, and what they like. And obviously, that's not the same thing as, as what um, they're serving here in the US. Um, there's also a perception that still exists among uh, consumers in Asia that coffee has a a bitter and unpleasant flavor. 
And that's why a lot of uh, Asian coffee drinkers add quite a bit of milk and sugar to, to their coffee. And if you go into a cafe in Asia, particularly one of the chain cafes, almost all of what you'll, be, what you'll see is a, is a milk-based beverage. Um, it's not a you know, straight shot of espresso. It's not even just um, a cup of um, uh, pour over. Uh, it's, it's a milk-based beverage. So I think the end result is that a true appreciation of specialty coffee, as we in this room may define it or know it, um, may still be somewhat limited, especially relative to the potential size of this market. But I think it's worth noting that um, this, this market this in Asia is still in its infancy. Um, it certainly doesn't have the longevity that uh, the North American and European markets have. Um, so again, it's just getting started. It's going to take a little bit of time, but um, you know, we, should, we should just be aware of, of what's going on. Uh, one of the obstacles um, of getting into the Asian market is um, the risk of mislabeling and false branding, what I would call sort of the coffee version of intellectual piracy. Uh, we're already hearing rumors of um, limited volume, high quality coffees, um, or sorry, high price coffees, um, such as Jamaica Blue Mountain, Hawaiian Kona, more recently, Geisha, Vridal, and uh, Kopi Luwak, the infamous Kopi Luwak. These are being uh, allegedly cut with uh, other beans, cheaper beans, and still sold as 100%. And in, in some Asian countries, there's a lack of a, an effective consumer protection agency to deal with this, and also it's just really hard to prove. So uh, that's kind of um, cutting down the integrity of um, of these products and, and sort of the appeal of wanting to sell these types of products in the Asian market. There's also quite a bit of bureaucracy and red tape. Um, this isn't exclusive to Asia, but it can certainly become a huge headache. Uh, let me give an example. Uh, let's say there's a roaster in China who wants to import specialty coffees uh, from um, an importer in, I don't know, Seattle. Um, and uh, this importer in Seattle to, in order to sell those coffees, needs to provide the original ICO certificate of origin for each coffee in that order, even if it's just one bag. And so if you can imagine the, the roaster in China wants, oh, two bags of your, you know, your, your relationship colo, five bags of your Hondo Microlap, blah, blah, blah. You, we have to send original documents for each of those um, coffees. And even if it was for the, um, just one bag, that documents representing the whole lot, which means we cannot sell that same coffee to anyone else in China because the document's already gone. And they need these documents to help the, uh, get the coffee through customs, and even those documents don't always, aren't always enough. Um, kind of a mess. I'll tell you more about that later if you're interested. But um, even if your company's on the smaller side and um, and or you have no, uh, no interest in Asia, I think it's still worth being aware of this market um, just because of the increased demand for higher quality coffees um, in Asia, particularly coffees from Central America and East Africa. Uh, there are buyers in, from Asia who are already going on sourcing trips to origin, and they're often looking for the same micro lots that we in North America um, have been used to getting uh, for ourselves. Um, so obviously this phenomenon presents a huge opportunity for producers and exporters at origin, but for roasters and retailers uh, here in North America, um, they're the new competition and they're not going away. So it's um, kind of you know, coming out of left field and, and they're just growing and growing. So regardless of your place in the industry, the Asian market's already here. Um, it's only gonna get bigger. Uh, like I said, it presents a great opportunity for some and a threat to others. But if we think in general terms of the North American market perhaps um, continuing to mature, uh, the rapid rise of Asia as a new frontier can only really be a good thing, um, particularly for producers, exporters, manufacturers, um, even some importers, roasters, and retailers who, who see opportunity there and want to take advantage of it. Um, the sky's practically the limit, and the prize goes to whoever can navigate what's admittedly a really complex business environment. Thank you for your attention.